Well, hello, Crusaders. Wherever you may be zooming in from, I want to welcome you to today's historical tour of our beloved Holy Cross, hidden virtually in plain sight, part four. Can you believe it? And if you've joined in any of our prior tours, you're probably thinking, this guy again? Yes, I'm back. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Tom Cadigan, and I'm blessed to serve as the Associate Director in the Office of Alumni Relations. And I am also a proud member of the class of 2002. Now I've had a lot of fun putting these virtual tours together. And one of my primary goals is to showcase the Holy Cross campus and highlight some history, mystery, and lore from our beloved alma mater, the castle on the hill. Now the pandemic, sadly, has put a pause on most visits to campus. So this tour aims to satisfy our craving for all things Holy Cross, albeit virtually. But I'm so happy to be with you today. We'll be together for just over an hour, and I encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A function on your toolbar. I will set aside time at the end to try and answer as many of your questions as possible. So fire away. Now, as I've done in the past, let me try to, here we go. Now, as I've done in the past, I wanna begin by briefly acknowledging two sources that were extremely helpful to me in putting this tour together. The first, pictured on the right, is the late Father Anthony Kuznevsky. Now, Father K, as many affectionately called him, was a beloved faculty member in the college's history department for several decades. He was also a longtime athletic chaplain and friend to numerous students, alumni, and families. He sadly passed away in 2016, but his memory lives on. Father K is the inspiration for these virtual tours. Second, I wanna thank the Holy Cross Physical Plant Department. In addition to maintaining and beautifying our campus, the hardworking members of that division have also left us a true treasure pictured on the left. Now, back in 2009, the physical plant published the third edition of the Holy Cross Campus Arboretum book, a fascinating read that highlights the colorful history of how the campus came to be. Now, this Arboretum book really got my mind spinning in preparation for this tour. Now, as you may know from now, if you've taken play, if you've um, participated in any of these tours prior, I like to keep these presentations interactive or at least as interactive as Zoom allows. So in true Father K fashion, I have a quick pop quiz. So you're gonna see a quiz pop up on your screen. All right, so here we go. No cheating, all right? So the Holy Cross campus with its terraced hills and sloping walkways is often affectionately referred to as Mount St. James. Who gave the land its saintly nickname? I'll give you a second to put in your best answer. Who gave the land known as Mount St. James its saintly nickname. I'll wait another few seconds. I see most of you have gotten your answers in. These won't be graded. I'm not passing out a blue book or anything like that. All right, I'll give you another two or three seconds. Who gave the land known as Mount St. James its nickname? All right, I'm gonna end the poll now. And now I'm gonna share the results. So, ooh, overwhelming majority, 63% of you say Bishop Fenwick. Um, about 26% of you say Father Fitton. Two people 
Yeah, two people said Father Hayes, and unfortunately, that's that's not the right answer. Um, but believe it or not, the uh, the majority of you are wrong, wrong. So the answer to the quiz is Father Fitton. So Father James Fitton, pictured here, was a Catholic priest and missionary active throughout New England in the mid 1800s. Now, yes, he is also the namesake for our fit and field, home to Holy Cross football and baseball. But back in 1836, while pastor of St. John's Catholic Church in Worcester, Father Fitton purchased 52 acres of land along the Blackstone River that would one day become Holy Cross. And on that sloping land, not far from where Fenwick Hall sits today, Father Fitton built a Catholic school for boys, which he named Mount St. James Academy after his patron saint, the apostle James. Now the academy closed and was demolished a few years later to make way for what became Holy Cross, but the moniker Mount St. James stuck and has remained for over 175 years. Now, glimpses of the past are still very present on campus today, just hidden before our eyes. Now, in his research, Father Kuznevsky found some evidence that Campion House, pictured here, nestled on the hill adjacent to the Jesuit cemetery, is a loose reconstruction of Father Fitton's original Mount St. James Academy building, which during the 1830s and early 1840s was a two-story building, approximately 70 feet long. So the similarities between the Academy and Campion are actually quite striking. Now Campion House, our Campion House, was built around 1906, 1907, originally serving as a residence hall for laymen who worked on the campus farm. And we're, we're gonna get to the farm in a little bit. Now, many of those laymen were Irish immigrants to either Worcester or to central Massachusetts. So named, after the Jesuit martyr and Irishman, St. Edmund Campion, the house has been almost like a Swiss army knife over the years, changing its functions. It's been a Jesuit residence, a laundry facility, even a pizza and a coffee shop, believe it or not. Campion is now the permanent home of the Office of the College Chaplains and the Campus Ministry Center. Now, under the chaplains' influence, the Campion House of today is known by students for its hospitality and its homey feel when entering. It's like stepping into your parents' living room or kitchen. You can smell mouth-watering cookies baking in the oven. There's, it's, it's a very homey, comfy place. Now, another source of hospitality in a different way, greeting new and returning visitors to campus each day is the college's unofficial front door, the impressive main gates located just off College Street. Now, I remember entering those gates for the first time as a prospective high school student and thinking to myself, man, this campus is legit. Now, while I admit that ideals don't always jive with reality, the main gates are nonetheless a beautiful symbol of welcome. And here's why. They never close. They're always open, even in pandemic. Now, first erected, in 1917, the original main gate, note the singular, the original main gate pictured here was a gift from the class of 1907 
in honor of the college's 75th anniversary that year. Now at 24 feet wide and 23 feet tall, it bore an estimated cost of just over $4,800, which was a lot back in 1917. And here in front of you is the original century old blueprints of that gate. Now, a few years before construction in 1915, 1916, in a letter to then college president, Father Joseph Dianin, the architects wrote, quote, we have endeavored to impart as much stateliness as possible in the scheme. The gate, feel, so we would put the, um, excuse me, I'll, I'll go back. We have endeavored to impart as much stateliness as possible in the scheme of the gate, feeling that a good deal of psychology is mixed up with architectural gateways, end quote. Now, the use of the term psychology is interesting, but if you think about it, it's somewhat true. Entrances matter. First impressions are important. And this gate certainly makes an impression. It, it did on me as a 16 and 17 year old prospective student. Now about 50 years after the original gate was installed, it was joined by a sister matching exit gate, a gift of that year's graduating class of 1959. So thus the completion of what we have today, the main gates, plural, of Holy Cross. They were separated by 50 years, but are only 15 feet apart. Now, this is a fun one. Just inside the main gates lies our beloved Linden Lane, a sloping pathway that ends at O'Kane Hall and Dianne and Library. Picturesque no matter what time of year, though as a native New Englander, I'm always partial to the fall. Now, Father Michael Earls, a professor of English in the early decades of the 1900s and an amateur arborist, planted the original line of linden trees extending from the chapel to College Street that became known over time as Linden Lane. Now, best known as a literary figure, Father Earl published some novels and short stories during his lifetime, along with three volumes of poetry. And I wanna to read to you the first stanza of a short poem he wrote about his devotion to the campus trees. This is from Father Earl's, quote, there's a hill that's always jolly in sunshine or rain. And the winding road that climbs it is dear old Linden Lane. Ah, Linden Lane, it's etched in many a crusader's mind. Or is it? To quote Paul Harvey, here's the rest of the story. Did you know that since the early 1980s, the Linden Lane that we love and we cherish is actually a misnomer. This is not a joke. For the past 40 years, no, and I repeat, no Linden trees have actually dotted the lane. You're probably thinking, what? The original Linden trees planted by Father Earls had been in decline since the late 1920s when major excavation began to take place around them. Originally, 15 trees grew alongside a cinder walkway pictured on the left, which was then replaced by a cement walkway. In the early 1930s, the lane was paved with blacktop, requiring more excavation 
and resulting in even more damage to the linden tree roots. And then in 1953, a parallel road was added, putting the trees under even more stress, so that by 1981, only six, only six dead or dying linden trees remained. And the college made a decision to replace them with 22 skyline locust trees, which we have today pictured on the right, skyline locusts. Now to protect these beautiful new trees, the college added a sprinkler system. It began sodding the median strip along the lane and it started using limited or careful use of de-icing salt in the wintertime. Now, though technically a misnomer, Linden Lane sounds much more inviting than Locust Lane, doesn't it? Um, in this era of marketing, um, when I think of Locust Lane, I think I'm walking up a path that leads to a biblical plague or something like that. So um, personally, I'm glad that the name Linden Lane has stuck. Now, speaking of being inviting, over the years, the college has received both national and regional accolades for its beautiful landscaping. Now, we may be slightly biased, um, but I doubt there are many campuses as picturesque as our Mount St. James. Now, since its early days, the college has always had a close connection to nature, the land and its local environment. And here's one example. In front of you is an image of the Hogan Oval, affectionately known by students as the Hoval, Hogan Oval, the Hoval. Since its creation in 2011, the Hoval has added a nice outdoor presence to the area behind the Hogan Campus Center. Nestled between Healy Hall, which is to the right of your screen, and Dian and Library, pictured to the left through the trees, um, there was, however, one casualty to this outdoor project. The loss of one of the last apple trees remaining on campus. The old, weakened tree, literally held up by metal rods, which you can kind of see in the photo on the right. So literally held up. This old tree was taken down in 2011 to make room for the hovel. Now the old apple tree stood for well over 100 years, dating back to the late 1800s a relic of the campus orchard that flourished for decades and was a key component of the college's early history. So this hidden gem, this apple tree, sadly no longer exists on campus. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about it and its cousins. Here's a fun image. It's an aerial of campus from the early to mid 1920s. Um, and we, we know this because, all right, let me see if I can do this. I'm gonna try to get a, uh, a pointer. Let's see, a laser pointer. We'll watch out. Oh, here we go. So the reason we think this photo is from, I'm guessing the years 1924 to 1926 is because St. Joseph Memorial, uh, St. Joseph Memorial Chapel opened its doors in 1924. And this is clearly here. But Dian and Library, which should be located here, doesn't exist yet. And that did not um, open its doors until 1927. So this photo was clearly taken somewhere in between. Um, now, if you look to your right of the photo, you can see this line of trees 
um, kind of extending all the way to where the hill dorms should be. Um, now, and can you see some of the garden beds as well, um, right by where the Hogan Campus Center is today? Now, from its founding in the 1840s, even up until the 1960s, much of the campus was utilized for vegetable gardens and nursery stock, trees, shrubs, and even livestock. We had pigs and cows and chickens roaming around Mount St. James. Now there was a Jesuit, his name was Brother Francis Hordowell. He was a member of the Jesuit community from 1891 until his death in 1944. Brother Hordowell established and maintained an apple orchard that existed from the spot of the future library, so right about here, extending all the way to the rear of modern day um, Healy, Lehigh, and Hanselman Halls, so right about here. So that old apple tree, which I showed earlier, was one of the last remnants of this orchard that extended right about here. And again, this aerial is from the 1920s. Um, this, is quite a, this is quite a picture. Um, now with apples and apple trees being so prominent on campus, it's no wonder our ne'er-do-well cousins from that school to the east, Boston College, often mocked us, believe it or not, mocked us at sporting events with the very disrespectful song, Oh, Holy Cross, Oh, Holy Cross, all they eat is applesauce. Well, now you know where they got the joke and we were the butts of that joke. Um, I've got some other imagery that speaks to the agricultural past of campus. Um, this is a fun image on the left. Um, that's Father William Casey in his tractor. He served the college for about 25 years teaching English, Arabic, and theology. And yes, tractors were very prominent in the first um, few decades of the 20th century. I, I like that image. I, I think it kind of really showcases um, what the college was like back then. Um, and then on the right is a really, really fun image that I want to credit Sarah Campbell in the college's archives office with sharing with me. This image was taken in the first couple of years of the 20th century, so a little before 1910. Um, probably closer to 1907, 1908. I'm assuming those are two students. This is the lower part of campus, um, right by where the present day St. Joseph Memorial Chapel is located. What I like about this image is it really shows how agrarian, how agriculture um, the campus was back then. And behind these two students, you can see a barn, you can see a cupola. Um, so it's, it's just a very, very neat image. It's what I don't think of as Holy Cross, but it's very much what the campus was like in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And clearly over time, buildings began to spring up around the farm as campus needs and priorities shifted. So we talked about the chapel, St. Joseph Memorial Chapel. Well, it opened its doors in the spring of 1924, and, and I circled that cupola. I'll go back. See, see the cupola in the lower right? Well, there's that same cupola. So where these students are standing is roughly where the main doors of St. Joseph Chapel was built. That's pretty neat, huh? So in just a few decades, the campus certainly built up from this to this, um, which, is, which is really interesting. And another thing that many people might not know is a rose garden, pictured on the, on the right, um, actually greeted visitors entering the chapel. Father Michael Earls, that same priest whom we talked about earlier, who planted the linden trees that became known as Linden Lane, he was the architect 
of this, of this um, rose garden in front of the chapel. So really for the first half or so of the, 20, of the 20th century, a rose garden was located right outside um, the chapel. Um, in the latter years of the 20th century, that rose garden was bricked over and a plaza took its place named Martyrs Plaza. Today, in the middle of the plaza sits an engraved medallion, you can see it on the right, commemorating the names of the six Jesuits and their two lay collaborators who were brutally murdered in El Salvador in November 1989 during the Salvadoran Civil War. Now the Jesuits were assassinated because they had spoken out against the government and were advocates for the poor and the powerless. Their deaths brought global attention to the conflict and helped bring about peace talks. Um, so I just like to demonstrate this, just showing how the campus needs and priorities have just shifted over time. Um, but before we move on, um, I do wanna go back briefly and talk a little bit more about that campus barn I highlighted in the uh, prior photo. So remember this aerial picture from the mid 1920s. I wanna draw your attention to the circle I highlighted right behind the chapel. So by the early 1930s, so roughly a decade after this aerial image was taken, though the apple orchard and the vegetable gardens remained very much active, the campus farm, especially its reliance on livestock, is shut down. So by 1933, the campus farm is shut down, having been unprofitable for some time. The red barn circled here, so that, that red barn circled here, nestled along the grassy slope behind the chapel, is converted into a gymnasium that included a basketball court, a bowling alley, and an observatory for astronomy classes. You can say a lot about the Jesuits. They are certainly resourceful to take a barn and turn it into a, a classroom slash recreational facility. Um, now it's in this reconverted barn, this makeshift gym, that history, basketball history, is made. Bear with me now. So basketball, barely 35 years old by the late 1930s, early 1940s, was just beginning to grow in popularity as a collegiate sport. Now with Holy Cross budgets being tight and campus space at a premium, the barn became the site of both varsity and junior varsity basketball practices. The court barely, I mean barely fit in it. At each end, there was about 10 feet of floor behind the basket. The sidelines were inches, inches from the wall. Um, so you clearly would put your life into your hands if you went diving for a loose ball. Um, talk about not being up to par with today's NCAA standards. Now, this jerry-rigged barn with no space for spectators meant that Holy Cross, by the mid-1940s, played its home basketball games across town at the old South High in Worcester, or even at the Boston Garden, 40 miles to the east. Now the less than ideal conditions only toughened the Crusaders' competitive will. And here's what that will and a lot of talent brought about. How about this? On March 26th, 1947, 74 years ago this spring, Holy Cross, led by All-American center George Kafton, class of 1949, 
made history by upsetting the University of Oklahoma to win the NCAA tournament championship at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Now talk about a Cinderella story. Now a very young Bob Cousy, class of 1950, was a freshman on that historic team. Now the Boston Daily Globe's front page account the next morning fittingly described the Crusaders as the quote, champions of the land from a red barn atop cold Pacachoag Hill in Worcester. Now Holy Cross was the only New England school to win a men's basketball NCAA championship until UConn won the crown in 1999. Now that 47 team gave new meaning to the term barnstormers and one can argue helped solidify Holy Cross's reputation on the national stage. Now, a few of the students and even some faculty who celebrated the 1947 basketball title run were veterans having served in World War II before returning stateside to Mount St. James on the GI Bill. The US entry into World War II changed life on the home front and, Holy, and the Holy Cross campus was certainly no exception. Now in the months leading up to and shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, enrollment dropped by about a third as students volunteered to serve in the US Armed Forces. And with the loss of students, Holy Cross had serious concerns about its financial stability and its future. The college received a lifeline, so to speak, by the addition of the Naval ROTC program and the Navy's V7 and V12 programs, which educated and trained students for camp for service, but they certainly changed the campus dynamics. So in May 1941, with the war raging in Europe, the Department of the Navy announced that Holy Cross would be among 22 colleges and universities to be added to the existing Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps units, Naval ROTC. U.S. Senator David I. Walsh, an alumnus of the class of 1893, who happened to be chairman of the Senate Committee on Naval Affairs, was a key player adding Holy Cross to that NROTC list. So here's an example of it's good to have political friends in high places. And by the fall of 1941, the first Naval ROTC class at Holy Cross had 115 freshmen, a quarter of the student body, and participants took courses designated by the Navy, including gunnery, seamanship, engineering, and naval tactics. And get a load of this. An anti-aircraft gun was installed in the basement of St. Joseph Memorial Chapel, which had been transformed into an armory and a drill area for use in bad weather. This image, I believe, is from the class of 1941 or 1942 yearbook. And you can clearly see Holy Cross students in uniform practicing on this anti-aircraft gun below St. Joseph Memorial Chapel. This is quite a this is quite an image, uh, but we do have a visual evidence that, that, this, did, that this did exist. Um, now, by the summer of 1943, the Navy provided additional support by including Holy Cross among the 131 colleges and universities out of over 1,600 applicants designated to participate in the V-12 Navy College Training Program to educate Navy and Marine Corps officers 
for the duration of the war. Now, this involvement in the V-12 program kept the college afloat financially. The Navy provided the college with income of over $670,000 in fiscal year 44 alone, which contributed to a budget surplus. And the V-12 program also had an impact on student life. Now, since they were eligible for varsity teams, the V-12 men literally rescued the 1943 baseball season, which had originally been canceled due to a lack of able bodies. The V-12 program also provided a boost for the basketball and football rosters. And the religious diversity of the Navy men prompted college administrators to suspend the practice of mandatory daily mass and probably for the first time in the school's history, religious services were held for non-Catholics. So despite some financial and extracurricular benefits and some religious leniency, the war brought with it much sacrifice. Nearly 4,000 Holy Cross alumni, students and faculty served in World War II. 109 gave their lives. Their names are inscribed on two commemorative wooden scrolls in the chapel, alongside those honoring similar sacrifices in the First World War, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. In fact, the chapel is dedicated in their memory. The official name of the chapel is St. Joseph Memorial Chapel, dedicated to the alumni who gave their lives in service to our country. Now, after the war, enrollment really took off. Class sizes swelled. So that by the mid 50s, early to mid 50s, to accommodate the large student body that came on campus, it could no longer fit all the students in St. Joseph Memorial Chapel. So a smaller chapel, Mary Chapel, located in the basement of the upper chapel is completed. Um, and Mary Chapel with its low arching ceiling is the same basement, you're, you're paying attention, is the same basement where that anti-aircraft gun and armory were located less than a decade earlier. Again, an example of Jesuit resourcefulness. And yes, with a new chapel in the mix, providing adequate worship space, mandatory daily mass, which was suspended in the mid forties, was reinstated by 1955. Um, and here's a picture of, of Mary Chapel back then, and then it's since undergone a beautiful renovation in the early 2000s. It's one of my favorite places on campus. Now, as the past proves, there is often tension between war and peace, faith and fighting, and our college's history is no exception. 15 years after Mary Chapel opened its doors, the Vietnam War brought debate and sometimes protest to the Holy Cross campus and to the wider Worcester community in the late 1960s and early 1970s. These images highlight that very tumultuous time on campus. On the left, taken in October 1969, students from the Worcester colleges staged a demonstration against the Vietnam War in downtown Worcester. At the podium, that's Holy Cross President, Father Raymond Swords, addressing the students. The middle image taken on May 4th, 1970, Ohio, Ohio National Guardsmen on the Kent State University campus where four students were killed and nine others injured during an anti-war protest. And the photo on the right, taken two days later, May 6th, 1970, 
showing some of the 1,200 demonstrators, many of whom were Holy Cross students who gathered at Lincoln Square in Worcester to mourn those killed at Kent State. Now, around the same time that the Kent State murders took place, the Holy Cross Faculty Student Assembly voted to join other schools in suspending classes for a week following the US military invasion of Cambodia and protests that erupted on college campuses across the nation. Check out this image. This was taken on the evening of May 5th, 1970, with tensions high at Holy Cross, about 200 students gathered outside the Air Force ROTC building to protest US involvement in the war and the college's support of ROTC in particular. Now the Air Force ROTC building was an old wooden structure located near Loyola Hall, not far from the Jesuits cemetery. As, as this image from that evening shows, Father John Brooks, located near the middle of the picture, then Dean of the college, stood at the door of the building to block the way of student protesters, while President Father Swords, who's not pictured in the image, explained that he had brought police guards to campus only to protect the building against the threat of vandalism and not to harass the students. And as you can imagine, it was a tense standoff. And this picture is certainly worth a thousand words. Now, though the Air Force ROTC building no longer exists, a physical image of this contentious era still remains on the campus today. A symbol of those debates over justice, war, police brutality, and faith that have never really gone away. This peace sign was painted on the roof of what is now the Millard Art Center. And it was painted sometime around 1970 1971. Now at the time, the building was used as a storage shed just uphill from the before mentioned Air Force ROTC building. Now in an effort to assert their agenda, activists painted the peace sign on the storage shed, probably thinking they were painting it on the ROTC building, a classic case of mistaken identity but the activists nonetheless got their point across. The peace sign remains to this day, 50 years later, a reminder of the intensity that has characterized campus dialogue and debate over the years. Now dialogue is at the heart of Jesuit teaching and very much embedded into the college's mission statement. Now there's another campus gem that reinforces this ideal. It particularly highlights interreligious dialogue. Now this treasure is located off the beaten path a bit, directly behind Dianan Library and not too far from Wheeler Hall and the Hogan Campus Center. Now not too many people know about this. A seven foot tall brown statue of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah is the creation of sculptor Chaim Gross. The piece was acquired by Holy Cross in 1979. Now Isaiah is depicted as having his hands above his head. He is holding spears in his right hand and swords in his left. Now a plaque on the brick base is inscribed with a quote from the book of Isaiah, chapter two, verse four. Quote, he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, 
nor will they train for war anymore, end quote. The statue is part of the college's Hyatt Holocaust collection, an affirmation of Holy Cross's commitment to teach its students about justice and the importance of moral choices. The statue's aim is to bring into focus the past, present, and future relationships between Christians and Jews. Now, St. Ignatius of Loyola himself, the founder of the Jesuits back in the 16th century, spent many years of his life thinking about these relationships with different cultures and faith traditions. He encouraged his fellow priests and brothers to do the same. The teachings and writings of St. Ignatius help shape Holy Cross, the institution, into what it is today. So it's probably no wonder that his name has been emblazoned across the campus in many ways, shapes, and forms. So before we wrap up today's tour, I have one more pop quiz for you. So let me pull this up. Well, first I'll get rid of my laser pointer. All right, pop quiz time. Pop quiz number two. Again, no cheating. In the spirit of St. Ignatius, what campus building was originally named Loyola Hall, but underwent a name change a few years later? I apologize that the question got cut off, but what campus building was originally named Loyola Hall, but underwent a name change a few years later? I'll give you about 10 more seconds to get your answers in. We have a clear leader in the clubhouse. I'm gonna give it maybe 10 more seconds. What campus building was originally named Loyola Hall, but underwent a name change a few years later? All right, I'm gonna end the poll. And the overwhelming leader, well, not really. 41% um, said Carlin Hall. 33% said Fenwick Hall. Um, and, oops, there we go. And if you said Carlin Hall, you are correct. My senior year dorm. So the student residence building opened its doors in 1922 as Loyola Hall to help ease student overcrowding on campus. But in 1941, almost 20 years later, the trustees voted to change the name in honor of Father James Carlin, the college's 17th president and the man who helped lead the fundraising effort to make the building a reality. But St. Ignatius would eventually get his due. The current Loyola Residence Hall located not far from the Jesuit cemetery, opened its doors in 1967. So we had a Loyola Hall, we didn't have a Loyola Hall, and now we have a Loyola Hall again. Um, now, I wanna finish up with a fun campus story that only recently came to light. So Carl and Hall, makes up the western edge of Kimball Quad, a beautiful open space that every hungry student traverses daily on his or her way into Kimball Dining Hall. Smack dab in the middle of the quad sits a large statue of Christ the King, erected in 1937 when Kimball opened its doors. The statue is gigantic. You can't miss it as you enter Kimball. Now, while you can't miss it because of its size, for many decades, eagle-eyed crusaders have often noticed that the statue itself is missing something, a cross, 
upon its top, along with its outstretched right fingers. Hmm. Now this curious conundrum baffled college leaders for years. Where did they go? Who took them? When? Now part of the mystery was solved when the late Tim Ferriss, class of 1968, returned the stone cross about a decade ago with a fun written explanation. And here's how the story goes, according to Mr. Ferris. During a particularly raucous snowball fight on Kimball Quad, heaven forbid, sometime during the mid 1960s, the small cross atop the statue was knocked off, hitting Mr. Ferris smack dab in the face. Now, not one to pass up such a unique memento, he pocketed the carved stone and didn't think much about it until he stumbled upon it when searching through some college memorabilia. And he returned it to Holy Cross. So this picture taken in 2015, that's Roger Hankins, retired director of the college's Cantor Art Gallery, proudly showing off the cross returned by Mr. Ferris. But this only solves part of the mystery. Christ the King is still missing two fingers. Anyone? Do you have it? Now in this context, it's perfectly acceptable to give the finger to the college. <laughs> now, we all have a love for Mount St. James and our time at Holy Cross. The campus and the people, they mean something, they matter. And though a fun anecdote, this statue story is a good reminder that no matter where we may roam in life, all roads lead back to the cross. And for us, the cross, our holy cross, is home. So earlier, I shared the first stanza of a short poem written by Father Michael Earls. Remember, he was a professor of English at the turn of the century and a lover of nature. I want to close by rereading that poem, but this time adding the second stanza. Quote, there's a hill that's always jolly in sunshine or rain, and the winding road that climbs it is dear old Linden Lane. Then we'll go give another Hoya as we go down Linden Lane, and we'll hear it in the echo when we come home again. God willing, over the coming months, this pandemic will come to an end. Things will get back to normal, and you'll be able to come home again. Mount St. James is waiting for you. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. All right. So I promised we would set aside time for some of your questions. So certainly fire away, fire away. Let me see, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna grab a drink. Okay. Now let me see what's on your minds. What is on your minds? Let's see. I remember the apple tree, Beth Anthony, class of 88. Um, for those of you who remember um, Father Paul Nelligan, um, a wonderful campus fixture. Um, he worked in the archives of Dine and Library. Um, many a time I'd be going to and from class and I would chat with him under under that apple tree. Um, I was definitely sad to see it go in, in 2011, but um, it was almost like a, uh, uh, 
one of those like uh, transformers with, with its metal rods um, keeping it up. Um, is there still ROTC on campus from Sharon Beauregard? Yes, there is. Um, we still have a, a very vibrant um, naval ROTC uh, unit on campus, the Crusader Battalion. Um, and the college never forget um, how the Navy really, really saved the college from financial peril um, during those first few years of the Second World War. And um, we, we've been very fortunate to keep that legacy and to keep that um, unit on campus since, since then. Um, let's see. Um, what other questions? Um, Tom, if you're looking at O'Kane Hall, I'm assuming from Linden Lane, to the right are all these bricked off windows. Why is that? Um, that is a good question. My, my guess is that that section of the building, even when O'Kane opened its doors in the 1890s, um, was dedicated as an auditorium and is now used as Fenwick Theater. Um, so my guess is that those windows, those fall windows, were bricked over for lighting, um, for the darkness of the uh, auditorium, which became Fenwick Theater. But it is, it is interesting, especially if you're on the upper hill, say walking out of uh, Hogan, um, or you're walking toward the hill dorms, and you look over at O'Kane and it just seems, it does seem strange that many of the windows on that side are, uh, are bricked over. Um, let's see, Tom, can you talk a little bit about the connection between Georgetown and the college's degrees? Um, that's an interesting one and, 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 and uh, a piece of our history that maybe a lot of people might not know. Um, so Holy Cross opened its doors in 1843. We awarded our first degrees in 1849. Um, college students back then, um, which is very different. Um, you know, I would say the average age of students on campus were probably between 12 and maybe 14. So um, higher education was not what it is today. So it took some of those early students a while to eventually earn degrees. But um, for the first, say, 20 years or so after degrees were issued in 1849, um, the college could not receive a charter from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We couldn't. And there's, there's some reasons why that might be the case. Um, you know, according to the state, um, we were not kind of up to speed or up to snuff according to their higher education standards. Um, in a lot of his research and writing, Father Kuznevsky claimed that there was a lot of Catholic bias on Beacon Hill. I mean, you're talking about the 1840s and 1850s. There were not a lot of Catholics in politics at that time. And, um, you know, a Catholic institution was looked down upon. Um, so we could not receive a charter for about 20 years or so. So for those first few years, uh, those first few graduating classes, um, the degrees were actually conferred by Georgetown University. So they were technically Holy Cross students. They spent their whole time in Worcester, but their degrees were sealed with the Georgetown seal. In fact, Bishop, um, uh, Bishop Healy, um, James Healy and all of his brothers um, their degrees would technically have been Georgetown degrees. And uh, I want to say it was right around the time that the Civil War ended, 1864, 1865, Holy Cross was finally able to receive a charter from the Commonwealth, and, um, and we were able to confer our own degrees. That's, that's an interesting story that, um, you know, I know Father Kuznevsky delved into it would be a it'd be an interesting um you know subject for for further study because there was a 20-year gap when we were not quote unquote legit in the eyes of, of the commonwealth of massachusetts so um so that's a good a good question why isn't campion visible in the 1926 aerial photo i don't i don't know um i don't know i'll have to let me go back. When did Holy Cross go co-ed um, from a parent? Um, Holy Cross went co-ed in the fall of 1972. 
Um, so the, uh, the four-year class of 1976, which entered as freshmen that fall, was the first four-year co-ed class in the college's history. Um, what some people might not know is there, there's actually um, a few alumni um, who are, are graduates of the class of 1974 or 1975. They transferred in to Holy Cross in the fall of 72 as upperclassmen, as sophomores, as juniors. A lot of them served as resident assistants on the uh, all-female floors, but um, it was the fall of 72 when Holy Cross went co-ed, which interestingly, we are approaching the 50th anniversary of that terrific, terrific milestone. Um, crazy to think 50, 50 years. Um, let's see. Um, any updates on where the Fenwick Bell might be? Um, I, I, Roseanne, I, I don't know. Um, that is a big caper that um, is, is unsolved to this day. It's what do they call it, a, a cold case. Um, you know, for those who may not be aware, um, Fenwick Bell, the original um, um, cast bell that rang in Fenwick Hall for um, decades, probably even a century, um, was actually um, cast in the foundry um, of Paul Revere near Boston. Um, it was taken down from Fenwick Hall and put almost in like a ceremonial place um, at the top of Linden Lane in the maybe early to mid seventies where it stood with a little plaque and um, you know, kind of had a little nice story of the history of the bell. Well, one day in 2009, the bell disappeared, like literally in, in, in plain sight. Um, and no one knows where, no one knows where it went. Um, you know, chances are it was probably melted down and sold on the black market because the copper in the bell would have been a, a pretty high commodity, but um, no one really knows. And what's kind of sad is um, as, as you walk up Linden Lane, the um, kind of the skeleton of where the bell stood is still there, um, which is which is sad, but we have not we have not been able to uh, to uh, solve that story, solve that mystery. Um, from Terry Reed, do you know if the peace sign has been repainted since it was originally placed there? It actually has been. Um, and I believe that every few years, um, physical plant touches up the peace sign. The, the original kind of look and layout of it hasn't changed, but they do touch it up. As you can imagine being on a, on a roof with white paint in New England, um, it, it would it would fade pretty pretty quickly. So to kind of keep that legacy going, um, the college maintains the peace sign, um, kind of keeping its historical significance. Um, let me see. Let's see. Um, let's see. Here's an interesting one, and maybe I'll. I'll I got two more questions. Um, when was daily mass no longer required? So I, I talked about, um, you know, daily mass being suspended during the Second World War, only to be reinstated um, in the uh, in the mid fifties. Um, it eventually was disbanded for good. Um, I want to say it was 1964. Father Raymond Swords um, got rid of daily mass. This was around the time of, of Vatican II. Um, and he, uh, he strongly encouraged Holy Cross students to attend mass, especially weekend mass, um, but um, realized that the, uh, the, uh, the need to force students to attend mass um, just, just wasn't, wasn't viable anymore, wasn't having an impact anymore. So, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting story. One can assume that um, daily mass was part of the, uh, the campus culture from its early days in the 1840s all the way until the 1940s, um, about a century. It was suspended um, to accommodate the, uh, the V-12 um, students during uh, World War II. It was reinstated in the 1950s and lasted for just about a decade when it was permanently taken away. Um, I want to say it was 1964. Um, it was during Father Swords's 
administration. And one, the, the chapel underwent a renovation, um, I want to say about a decade ago, it was probably 2010, 2011. Um, and one thing that I was just um, disappointed that they got rid of was the numbers on the pews are, are no longer there. Um, and, you know, working reunions as a student and, and even as a staff member, um, it was always fun to um, hear some of the Purple Knights say, there's my pew, I was pew 32, I was seat number four. Um, you know, I thought that was a nice kind of relic tie-in to, to our past um, that, that is no longer there. The, the numbers are now, are now gone. Um, and really the last question, and then I'll, and then I'll wrap it up, um, was, here, it's an interesting question. Can you talk a little bit about the Native Americans who claimed um, South Worcester as their home prior to, to Holy Cross? Um, I could talk a little bit about it. I know that um, the Nipmunk tribe, um, which was the inland section of the Massa Massachusetts um, tribe of Native Americans claimed many areas of, of Worcester and not too far from where um, Holy Cross sits right now. They're not related at all to the Wampanoag um, tribes, which when you think of pilgrims, when you think of Cape Cod, this was a totally distinct um, nation, the Nipmunk nation, located in central Massachusetts, northern Connecticut. Um, and I believe the name Pakachoag, the land of many springs, another nickname for, for our hill, um, is a Nipmunk, um, is a Nipmunk name. Um, well, that, that tribe, along with many of the Massachusetts tribe, was decimated by smallpox um, around the time of the pilgrims landing in, in the 1620s. And, and they contracted smallpox from um, European traders, European, um, um, you know, like beaver traders and, and beaver hunters um, coming down into central Massachusetts from, uh, from Maine. Um, so they did they did have a, a culture in the area of Worcester that that Holy Cross was built on that, that Father Fitton um, acquired and that uh, that the college kind of grew from. So, um, you know, we do have a connection to uh, to our Native American past, uh, particularly um, the, the Nipmunk tribe. Um, and I guess being mindful of everyone's time, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause it there, but um, I, I, I hope you enjoyed this. I do have to say this has been an absolute blast to put together. Like, I cannot believe that we've done four of these, um, but, uh, but I, I, I thank you so much for your involvement, for your interest, um, and uh, I really do hope that when this pandemic is behind us, a, you can get back to campus and B, perhaps I can have an opportunity to give you an in-person tour and meet you in person and actually show you, we can touch, we can feel the actual sights of, of campus. So until then, um, you be well, stay safe um, and enjoy your evening. Thank you everyone. This has been a lot of fun.